Here we are in what looks like a normal suburban garden in Leicester. But in actual fact, hidden at the end of this garden, we have a unique racing car owned by enthusiast John Pescott. Mr. Pescott, I presume. Oh, morning, Mr. Hurst. <laughs> I think I've caught foliage on me there. So here's the wonderful beast. Lying under this tarpaulin is a car racing classic. A 1969 Lola T142 Formula 5000. Less than 50 of these have been built in the entire history of racing. I bought it in 1978 uh, with the plan that uh, I was going to run it in Formula 5000 uh, competition. And it was an absolutely ideal opportunity to start a team. Um, unfortunately, for various reasons, mostly financial, that didn't really happen. Bizarrely, although he's had it for over two decades, John's never heard the Lola's engine run. Although he drives other classic cars like this Allard, his boyhood dream to manage his own motor racing team never came true. When, when did you last run? I ran in 77. 77, so what, what 23, 20, 24, 24 years. years ago. 24 years ago, yeah. Because the engine's been silent for such a long time, if the squad just tried to start her up now, it could easily explode. The engine's pure American grunt, five litres of race-tuned Chevrolet V8. It has the power of four family cars, can push the Lola to 200 miles per hour and hurtle her from 0 to 60 in under four seconds. I've never driven anything like this. I don't know of you guys. No, I wouldn't want no. to go there. No, but it looks clear sized. It looks clear sized. It's tiny, isn't it? Jerry, have you ever driven one? Yes. You've driven one? Yes. But you drive like a granny. That's all right. Why, how come you've driven one? I used I to mean, race. Oh. I've got a National A competition license. A license? Yes. You've got to have a license to drive these? Yes. So I can't just use my driving license? No, nope. Motorsports Association competition license. <laughs> Grandma Jerry might be more suited to driving Miss Daisy, but he's the only one qualified to drive this old lady, which puts him into pole position in John's team. Not only have the squad promised John they'll get the Lola running again, but they've also said she'll be ready to race against other 5000s at Mallory Park in Leicestershire, a track that hosted Formula 5000 in its very first season back in 1969. The problem is the current season is perilously close to finishing, and if the squad can't fix her before it does, then Jerry's opportunity to race her will be gone. In the world of motor racing, it's a car's formula, or class, that governs which cars can race against each other. Formula 5000 and Formula 1 look pretty much alike. They both have a low chassis, a tin tub for the driver, and widely spaced wheels with huge tyres. The crucial difference is that Formula 5000s have much bigger, heavier engines. But it's the Lola's huge rear wheels that are the squad's first obstacle. They've got to get this car out of John's garden to a proper workshop on the other side of the Midlands. I came through your garage on the way down into your garden. Yeah. And it's a pretty wide car, isn't it? You it's know, a pretty wide car. And I, it's, I can't see this getting through the garage at this width. No. We shall have to make some plywood discs. We can reduce that sufficiently to get it through the access. So the squad's first task is to turn this Grand Prix winner into a posh go-kart with plywood wheels so they can take it to Wolverhampton. Well, it should be easier when we get some petrol in it. <laughs> it's cheaper than four stars. John's car is one of only 45 T142s ever built by British racing car manufacturer Lola. They were designed back in the 60s for the early days of Formula 5000. This new formula had taken the racing world by storm, smashing the lap record at Brands Hatch. Formula 5000s were faster than Formula 1s on the straight, reaching nearly 200 miles per hour. But they handled terribly on corners because the heavy engines caused the car's back end to swing wildly. To me, getting in a car that's itching to spin like a top seems like madness. But at the Wolverhampton workshop, Jerry's just busting to drive this brute, which right now is more mouse than monster, and a battered one at that. Right, first thing first, since we've got a soft tyre, she's twisted. 
This workshop belongs to specialist engineer Paul Myatt, who maintains a priceless team of classic racing cars for an American collector. Paul's the man who's going to help the squad find any hidden faults and prevent Jerry being turned into strawberry jam on the track. You've got fuel lines here that, instead of being pliable, they've actually gone completely yeah, hard. Rigid, they? They've gone really hard. As I say, it's just a, a complete time warp, this car. You, you just don't see them like this. Time warp or not, there are some major tasks ahead if the squad are going to get the Lola back on the circuit. All of which will push Axel to new heights of expression, Jerry to get on his knees, Claire to come through when the chips are down, and the whole squad to come face to face with the scary reality of motor racing. As the squad work on the classic racing car, Lola T142, they're discovering her hidden history of cracks and damage. There's no manual for the Lola, so before they take it apart, the squad have to measure and make note of every angle of every bit of the car, so they'll know how to put it back together. But as they tinkered, I spotted something fishy. Is this bent, mate? Yeah, we just found that out. Um, I was doing a measurement between here and here, and there and there, and it was half a centimetre out. And I thought, like I do, that it was the adjustment in here. Yeah. But as our man here just pointed out, it's had a smack. And that's it's quite what, a... they've compensated for that, which has put it out. While you're at it, you're going to have a look at this, then. What's that? That's like a banana. Like a banana? Yeah, it's bent. What, what bananas have you been eating? Bent ones, mate. Long silver Long ones. Long silver bent bananas. <laughs> I think it's taken a whack here, look. This plate... Oh, I can see that's bent. Now get your fingers in there. Paint's splintered off. So a look. Oh, yeah. And it's bent there. Oh, dear. The car's been in a smash. Not that surprising for a classic racing car. Parts of the chassis and suspension are bent, which could have serious implications for the car's handling. At the moment, it's impossible to gauge the extent of the overall damage, so to get to the heart of the Lola's troubles, the squad must take her apart, starting with the front wheels. If you've ever wondered why the wheels on a racing car stick out from the body, it's because the wider they are apart, the better the road handling. And to bring these massive wheels to a halt, the car needs some pretty serious brakes. Those huge circles of metal are the brake discs, and they take a hell of a hammering on the track. It's nothing like pootling around town in a mini, tickling the brakes every couple of minutes and slamming them on once in a blue moon. On the track, the brakes are whacked on at speeds of around 100 miles per hour every 20 seconds or so. And at the end of the straights, drivers are standing on the pedal at speeds little short of 200 miles per hour. And it's Claire's job to make sure the Lola's brakes are gonna work. That's the brake pads. I think we'll have to get new ones of those. A road car's brakes will last around 10,000 miles. The Lola needs a new set every single race. The system works just like the rubber brake pads that squeeze the wheel on your bike. Inside this moulding, called a caliper, are two hydraulic pistons that will press the pads hard against the brake disc when the driver stamps on the pedal. When you stamp your foot hard down on the brake at the front of the car, it's an enclosed system with fluid in it, and uh, fluid's incompressible, so it has to go somewhere. It travels down these very, very thin pipes, so it gets down here to the shoes at the end, and because it's got to move somewhere, it pushes the brake pads in and stops the wheel on the shaft and hopefully you come to a grinding halt. Fixing these brakes could be the most important job Claire's ever undertaken. They're the only things that will stop Jerry hitting the barriers at 150 miles per hour. And Jerry knows it's time to get out his best chat-up lines. I love you. <laughs> You're great. You're magnificent. And, and, and anything, okay. else, and, and anything else that might result in okay. you making a really good job of the brakes. Please grovel, just grovel, just grovel. Be all right, Jerry. Be all right. Sure, they'll be grand. Jerry and Axel are dismantling the front of the Lola. The most important component at the front of the car is called the upright, a complex casting that connects all the other parts: the wheels, steering, suspension, and brakes. 
and it's the uprights that Jerry and Axel are struggling to take apart on the bench. Jesus. Over in the corner, Claire is having a blast cleaning another upright with a high-pressure jet of sand in readiness for an X-ray which will show up any hidden faults. Uprights must be made from lightweight materials and the lolas are made from magnesium alloy which is light but not very durable. If it's weakened with age, these vital parts won't do their job and would cause the wheels to part company with the car at high speed. So it was down to me to take them off for a checkup. Claire, any luck on the parts yet? Oh, I've got them here. Is that the lot? Yeah. All right, go on. The engineers. Oh, Should right. get the door? Yeah. Go on. We'd be lucky if we still make this, you know. If you miss your x-ray appointment, it's just like the hospital. They don't like it. <laughs> Bye. At the local hospital for sickly metals, consultant Barry Plant was waiting to x-ray our uprights to see if they would reveal any hidden fractures. The test for cracks and flaws in magnesium is done by an x-ray twice as powerful as that needed to scan human bone. And all done in the twinkling of an eye. Here are the results, and they're not very good. Just an area up the top there with an indication in where it's been welded. Where's that? On the top corner. It looks like the crash that bent the chassis has also damaged the uprights. Axel, come over here. Come here, Jill, clear. Oh, I've got the x-rays. Here we go. I've got some good news and some bad news. What do you Come want first? Hit us with the bad news. The bad first. news. That's handy because I've got the bad one up here. We have got a nasty crack. Can you see that? Across there. Just across there. <laughs> now the guy reckons that it may have been there may have been some kind of damage to it and they've done a weld on it and the weld was no good. So that one is gonna need a little bit of work doing to it. Okay. Now the next one, now this one he reckons not as bad, but this is good news. No, this is the slightly it's better. I forgot I did good, bad and better. Right? This is this is slightly better, but can you see that light bit there? Mm -hmm. Apparently that's a weld, another weld on it. But he reckons that's not as bad as the other one, so it probably needs less right. attention doing to it. So there's a little bit more work there. Thank you very much. I mean you're not looking happy, boys and girls. More work. But we can get that welding done. But this is what you're for, you see. I think we should do a group hug. Because I'm, I'm sensing, I'm sensing deflation here. Come on, I think, I think it's time. I think it's time we, we just put it back together again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I <laughs> <it's not laughs> say. Yeah, are you feeling better already? Tearing myself away from the squad's loving arms, I left them to worry about the uprights while I set off to investigate the Lola's past life. Got some information here from John Peskett, the owner of our Lola racing car, and uh, it's actually got the racing history of it. And what's interesting is on the 13th of April 1969, it actually came first. It won a Grand Prix race, and at that time it was driven by a chap called uh, Keith Holland. It was in a place called De Girama, which I guess possibly Spain, somewhere like that. And I reckon Keith is possibly the chap to track down and fill in a few more gaps about the history of our little Lola. <laughs> When the Lola's Grand Prix winner, Keith Holland, started racing, it was the swinging 60s, and racing was sexy. More and more drivers wanted to get into really fast cars, but Formula One cost a packet. It was to get round this that some clever geezers came up with the idea of race-tuning 5-litre Chevrolet engines and squeezing them into Formula One chassis. The result? Formula 5000. Very fast cars at around five grand. About the same as a couple of E-type Jags back then. Still a bit beyond the pocket of your ordinary boy racer, but for those with the cash, the car was theirs for a fraction of the cost of Formula One. Right now, we'd be lucky to get a fiver for ours at a car boot sale. It's been stripped down to just a load of welded tubes and an engine. And the engine, a quarter-ton lump, is proven a pig to get out of the chassis. Is it going to go? Is it going to go? This engine is full-on, balls-out American engineering. 
Although it's been totally rebuilt for racing and is 50% more powerful than a factory engine, at heart it's still a Chevy V8. Its name stems from the way its eight cylinders are arranged in a V-shape rather than a straight up and down configuration. V because the V-shape is more compact. It allows larger cylinders to be fitted into a smaller space than is possible with the conventional straight line arrangement of cylinders. The result? More power. It might be full of grunt, but this is precision engineering at its finest and it has to be treated with kid gloves. One, two, three. Wow. As they strip it down, it gives them a nasty surprise. All right, let's have a look. Give it to us. Okay. Oh, mate, look. Oi! What? Where did that come from? Water out of the number one. Oh, you are joking. joking. No. It's come out big time, look. Oh, no. Yeah, mate. Oh, God, no. Oh, God, yes. <laughs> This is pretty serious. The water could have corroded the very heart of the engine, known as the cylinder block. If it has, it's a write-off. Inside it, each of the cylinders is surrounded by water passageways, which cool it down. The fear is that over the last 20-odd years, old water from the cooling passageways has corroded through the cylinder block into the cylinder itself, making an irreparable hole in the cylinder wall. No, if it's done what I think it's done, I just hope to God it hasn't. We'll find out. Then take them off. Just take it off. Ooh, not good. Not good. Not only is there water, there's rust on the pistons. This means they're ruined, but at least they can be replaced. If they find the cylinder walls have been corroded too, then the engine is as good as knackered. Axel turns the engine so Jerry can see into the cylinders. Thankfully, the cylinder walls are undamaged. I don't think the walls have been in there long at all. That's all I really don't. No? No. All right, cool then, we're lucky. Jerry can breathe again. The cylinder block seems OK. But having to fit a new set of pistons is yet another obstacle on the road to Mallory Park and the big race. That's much nicer. Yeah. While our Lola's future racing career started to look decidedly iffy, I was finding out about the old girl's celebrated past from racing historian Dave McLaughlin. Our car's uh, a T142. I don't know if that means anything yeah, to yes, you. Yes, it does yeah. indeed, yeah. And um, I just wondered if you knew anything about it, really. Well, certainly the, in terms of the type, the T142, it was very successful in, in the early days of Formula 5000. And some quite famous drivers uh, took part in, in, in Lola's. I've uh, had a look at the racing history of our car, and it won uh, a Grand Prix in 1969 in Madrid. And um, the chap who was driving it was called Keith Holland. And I wondered if you've heard of this, this guy at all. Well, certainly Keith was uh, uh, one of the more prominent drivers of the time. He drove the Lola T142 for a guy called Alan Fraser. And Alan Fraser actually had a very, very successful team of Hillman Imps and then decided to move into single-seater racing cars and bought a Formula 5000 car and Keith Holland drove for him and was, was pretty successful during the first couple of years of Formula 5000. And do you know if he's still around? Keith certainly is still around. You, you hear his name and he's local to Brands Hatch and that would be the place to find him. While I was making progress, the squad weren't. The car was in pieces and they were on course to let down John, the Lola's owner, as the chances of her racing again looked increasingly unlikely. The magnesium uprights are cracked and a specialist welder has yet to be found to fix them. On top of that, Jerry's making pretty slow progress with the engine. Meanwhile, the car's chassis has gone off to be crack tested for safety, leaving the squad to make sure that all the other parts of the car are 100% perfect before they can reassemble them. As Axel dismantles the steering, he quizzes boy racer Jerry about his early days. How did you start in your racing? Me? Yeah. Uh, I was 19. I couldn't pass my driving test. <laughs> oh, that's fun. 
I failed my driving test on no, no fewer than three occasions. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> then I thought it might be a good time to take some lessons. That's uh, trifle, that's 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 trifle that's overconfident there, I think. That is such a Jerry thing to do, isn't it? Yeah. The Jerry Thurston story mm. continues. Well, if you think of any other funny things, give me a shout. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I build engines because girls wouldn't go out with me. <laughs> you can't blame a whole sex <laughs> for your hobby. Look, mate, if you go down the disco and you can't pull, you may as well stay at home and build engines. <laughs> oh, God. I can, see, I can see some theory there somewhere. I just can't get to grips with it somewhere. <laughs> they understand me. Ah. Jerry's in seventh heaven. He's got a bucket load of shiny new bits, a new set of pistons, and a hot date with the engine. Scrumptious. While Axel gets on with the more mundane task of cleaning and checking his namesakes, the Axels. Claire's come up trumps. She's found specialist welders to mend the cracked uprights. Hello. Hi, Claire. You must be Bill. Yeah. But I wonder if you can help. Mm-hmm. Magnesium is notoriously difficult to weld, and there's only a 50% chance that welding will solve the problem. Unfortunately, the cracks are in a particularly vulnerable spot, right where the brakes bolt onto the uprights, and welding them won't guarantee that they'll be strong enough to take the strain. Well, fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Okay, right. Yep. The welds look good, but will they be up to the job? Back in the workshop, race engineer Paul Myatt is about to find out. He's got to recut the vital screw threads that the brakes will actually bolt onto. This is a delicate operation. If the welds don't hold, the uprights may be impossible to mend again. Their fate is in the balance. We've got a bit of a problem there, mate. So the re-weld hasn't worked on that? No, when right. you were trying to thread it, yeah. and it's just, the material's yeah. just gone. New item. <sighs> There's only one place for the uprights, the bin. But spares are rarer than snow in the Sahara, and without new uprights, the Lola ain't going nowhere. No replacements exist, so new ones must be cast, seriously threatening the squad's deadline. Even ever resourceful Axel is depressed and gives voice to the unthinkable. It seems to be a bit of a daunting task, and to be honest, I wouldn't be too surprised if we don't get this finished. Um, everything that we've come across so far has been broken in some way or some sort. If it hasn't been fixed, it's going to be modified. And hot on the heels of gloom is more bad news. The steering rack's bent. This collar here looks bent. It looks out of line. So. I mean, that's wear, which I don't think so, or it's had a bit of a shunt. It's taken a whack, has put everything out. As the squad work on the classic racing car, Lola T142, they're discovering a hidden history of cracks and damage, and it's with a growing sense of apprehension that the squad continue to take her apart. And hot on the heels of gloom is more bad news. The steering rack's bent. This would indicate our car has taken a hit on its front right side. This has bent the steering rack which runs between the wheels and moves left and right as the steering wheel is turned. Beneath it there's another component, the front suspension rod. It helps keep the car level as it corners and Axel's worried it's damaged as well. Sure enough, it's bent. Time for the big man to straighten them with some old-fashioned technology. OK, so we have to bend this up. It's a real scientific thing we're going to use here. One of these. With an old piece of scaffold tube to physically bend the bar and a measuring arm that will show Axel when the bar is straight and level, he can start to bend the suspension rod back to its original shape. Oh, yes. Ta-da! One straight bar. 
The other bent piece is the steering rack. Paul's technician, Tony, assesses the damage. He fixes up a special measuring gauge that can show to the nearest thousandth of an inch how much the bar is bent. Jeez, that's gone down to what? So 40... 42 there, that is here. So in new money, 42 thousand is approximately a millimetre. A whole mill, that is very bent, isn't it? Yeah. Straightening the steering rack is a delicate operation. It's time for the gentle touch. Should be all right. The bar is checked. Has Axel mastered the art of straightening, or will the rack follow the uprights to the tip? Well, yeah. That's got it. That's within three thousand work. So that's within an acceptable distance? Yeah. All right. Let's get back in our car. Still no new uprights, but the good news is the chassis passed its safety test. It might have been deemed safe, but Axel spots something. It's not straightened. Where? There. Uh, Jerry, tell me that's it's not it's bent, it's bent, it's right. well bent. It'll be all right. Sledgehammer, mate. And taking a sledgehammer to the car is exactly what's on Axel's mind. I think she's got a jigsaw puzzle. Pieces. My last car was bent all over the shop and handled beautifully. Oh, no, yeah, they, they, yeah, of course they should be absolutely 100% There you go. Did you just answer my question? But no. this is pretty good. So this is the whole point. We've seen better. Don't That's say restoration because no, no, that no. word is really doing my nothing. This is the whole point about engineering is you can build things perfect, absolutely perfect, down to the last thou, but you don't. Yeah, your house at home, it's not straight. It's probably got an, a vague approximation to right oh, yes. angles. Someone actually changing the tune here. I think before it was got to keep it as close to the original as possible. Yeah, you've got to keep use the same nuts and bolts. Yeah, but. But if it's got kinks in it and it's been battered in, in its working life, it's, then that's part it's of not its been battered, history. it has been An engineering. smashed. It hasn't been battered, it's been smashed. Most people would write off this car. No, they wouldn't. It's short of building a nice new chassis, which we're not going to do, because you may as well build a new car. We've, we work with what we've got. Here, Jerry might just have a point. Crashing cars is part of the racing game. And if they're not a complete write-off, they're simply rebuilt, dents and all. And with the threat of all that bumping, there's one safety feature that every driver demands, a roll bar. And Jerry's no exception. What are you doing now? If I have an accident, yeah. there, there is a chance, however remote, that we might roll the car. Right. So what I want is a hoop behind my head yeah. that comes up sufficiently that the front of the car here yep. and the hoop touch the ground As and I'm in this safe so little envelope. And there's no bits of you hanging out the side or anything like that, you're just tucked in. That goes on the front of the chassis, actually okay. touching it, yeah. Yep. That goes behind me. I can't see that taking a lot of punishment, Jerry, it's only cardboard. <laughs> well, hold on, Jerry, where does this sit on the frame? Between the two lugs. And we want five centimetres. Right, you want it from the top of your head, yeah? Yeah. That's five there, so you're going to have to lower it way down. Go a bit more, yeah. Keep going, keep yeah. going. I mean, six would be better. All right, Five's well, going up. Six, there we go, stop moving. Smashing. Yeah. Now, are you sitting there? You'd be sitting if you were driving. Uh, more or less, yeah. Yeah, so you'd have one hand on your head, <laughs> one hand on I'd your left. That would be it. Stay still, stay still. Right, got it. Mark it off to where it would touch the, the frame. There we go. Are you done? done? Yeah. Right, you're... Move the pole. There you go. Oh, dear. So it should be like this, shouldn't it? He's <laughs> 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 written R.I.P. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, keep that. We might need... It looks like that. Are you sure you want to do this, Jerry? Jerry lays here. Are you sure you want to do this? <laughs> oh, yeah. What's the car been called in the past, Jerry? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, What's the car been called in the past? The leather cheap 142 is known as the Widowmaker. The Widowmaker. Oh dear. If the squad ever do get the Lola to Mallory Park racetrack before the end of the season, it's no wonder John, the Widowmaker's owner, was keen for someone else to get behind the wheel. But naturally, as team manager, he's concerned about Jerry. 
Well, I suppose I am a bit apprehensive, yes. Uh, I think it's going to be a bit of a, a, bit of a shock, perhaps. Um, but we, we, shall, uh, we shall find out. We'll take it fairly sensibly, I think, for a start. Um, lead into it fairly gently, and then hopefully, a bit later on, we'll see just what it can do. But he could have a long wait, because the squad still haven't got any uprights. Still, they're pressing on with work they can do. Claire and Paul are fitting brake pipes to the chassis. Got the other hand. Axel is cutting new screw threads in the suspension rods that hold the wheels to the chassis. Nope. And Jerry's finished off the engine so the squad can finally get it back in the car. But without new uprights, it could all be in vain. Meanwhile, I've come to Brands Hatch, the birthplace of Formula 5000. I'd arranged to meet Keith Holland, the man who drove our car to Grand Prix victory in Spain in 1969. In those days, Formula 1 and Formula 5000 often competed in the same race. And Keith and his mates were soon thrashing the pants off the Formula 1 boys, which upset them a bit. Keith, you used to drive at a car, the T142. Yeah, I did, yes. How did it compare the 5000 to the Formula 1? The only advantage the Formula 5000 had was that they had more power in a straight line than what the uh, Formula 1 had. When you came to corners, of course, you've got a big lump of Chevy engine in the back. Did that make it a little bit more dangerous, the 5000, because you're trying to compensate for that? I suppose it did in some respects, yeah. It took me some time to get in the swing of, you know, going fast with the damn thing. Yeah. Because it was a handful, there's no doubt about it. We've got a bloke called Jerry, mm. who's going to be driving your old car. Well, I'd like to come along, you know, if he's going testing or something, I'll come along with him. You, would you up, you'd be up for that? Mm, of course I will. That's the best that's If the he's best no good, I'll event. tell him to get out and I'll get in myself. All right, then. <laughs> <laughs> Back at the workshop, the squad have come up with a plan while they try to find a foundry that can cast new uprights. They'll reassemble the car with broken ones in order to test the engine. seems so obvious when we took it apart. I know, but now it's all lost in a sea of fuzziness. A sea of sub-assemblies. And Claire prepares the new brakes on which Jerry's life will depend. He's a brave man to trust it to me. Jerry's not only feeling brave, he's feeling protective about the Lola. But Axel's being driven to brute force. No, don't. Oh, will you put a cap in it, Sonny? Why? Why do you want me to put a cap in it, Axel? Ooh. Because you that bottom bone, that's why. Ooh, get your bra on, girl. With a set of new tyres, the Lola is starting to look like a car again. All racing cars are tailored to their drivers, and if Jerry's going to drive this beast, every bit of the Lola has to be tweaked to fit all six foot six of him. And this includes a custom-made seat. It's a sophisticated and dignified process. Poured into a bin bag, these two chemicals will react together to become a quick-setting foam. Jerry must then sit on it and keep absolutely still for 15 minutes while the foam swells and sets into a perfect fit for his bottom. Good his watch. <laughs> and to make sure he doesn't move an inch, Axel helpfully ties his shoelaces together. Well, good night then. Bye, Jerry. Cheers. Bye. Where's the lights? No. Boys. Claire. Axel! It's the last week of the season, and hopes of racing the Lola are fading. She's all dressed up in her original Grand Prix colours, but she won't get on the starting grid unless the squad can find a foundry to cast the vital uprights in time. And they're desperately hoping that somewhere out there, there's one that can. Meanwhile, they've stuck the dodgy uprights back on in order for the car's engine to be tested on what is known as a rolling road. It's like a jogging machine for a car. The metal rollers spin as fast as the car wheels run. Special sensors attached to the steel drums measure the speed of the car and the power output of the engine. 
Another sensor analyzes the exhaust, while others are used on the electrics to test if the engine's running smoothly. The sensors are all hooked up to a computer, which analyzes the data. And it starts first time with a roar. The engine's running smoothly and the car is producing more power than the scale can read. Like a race car. It's a car, yeah. It smells like a race car. Yeah. It so gives power like a racing car. Yeah, the <laughs> produce, going all the yeah, way around. Produce good power. It's a bit horribly real now, isn't it? <laughs> Job done. It's good to hear a fire up. I'm frightened. I'm... It's a lot of horsepower, big car, and I've never driven anything this quick before. Jerry's starting to sweat, but there's no backing out now. After several agonising weeks, Claire's tracked down Creasy Castings in Kent, a specialist foundry who can make new uprights for the Lola from scratch. A mould is made by packing a mixture of sand and resin around an original Lola pattern for the upright. 20 minutes later, the mould turned hard and grey. Heat from a blowtorch creates a thin layer of carbon inside the mould to ensure a smooth casting. The two halves of the mould are stuck together and molten magnesium is poured in at a temperature of 700 degrees centigrade. With the uprights cast, they're finished off in a machine shop to get them ready for the car. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Right, back to the car and let's fit them up and go racing. It's the big day. And despite the setbacks, the squad have made it to Mallory Park Racetrack. And hopefully John's dream has come true. He's got a team, the Lola's ready to run, and four other cars have turned up for a race. So what does he think? John, are you pleased to see it back together like this? Oh, I think it's absolutely wonderful, yeah. It does, it does look nice. Oh, it's it? fantastic, isn't it? After, after all these years, I think it's, oh, it, no. it's absolutely brilliant. You're not going to leave it in the garage for another 20 odd years, Oh, no, 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 it'll be out and about now. It's Jerry's moment of truth, but he's already making excuses. All my nightmares have come true at once. It's, uh, it's cold and it's slippery and it's damp and it's not a good time to learn a Formula 5000, but have a go. Out on the track, the other cars seem happy enough until disaster strikes. Somehow, the driver walked away from this one, but the car looks a wreck. Jerry is shaken, but not deterred. One less T142 now. That'll, that'll rebuild. The good bit is, bloke got out of it, which means it's a strong car and it's not a problem. They only go as fast as your footwork, so... It's a shame it's taking the shine off the day, as far as I'm concerned, but uh, I think I'm still going to have a play. The new addition to rent a wreck was taken away, and the remaining cars carried on with their practice as if nothing had happened. Then the old track sculpture Keith Holland turned up. Should he be safety conscious? Be careful. Careful? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, be careful. I don't know what the engine produces or anything, but very capable things, about 160 mile an hour. And what do you think he should do? About 60. <laughs> <laughs> Turns out Keith himself had a few close calls back here in the 70s. In one race, he crashed straight through the barrier and ended up in the lake. Still, he knew the track well and used to hold the lap record of 51.2 seconds. This seemed a good challenge for Jerry, and we decided to take bets on his lap time. Should we run a book on it? Would you? I think. Mean, uh, How long? 51.2 is a record. 51.2 is a pro. No, I reckon Jerry. He won't get a minute and a half. So you're saying 90, 90 seconds. 90 seconds. Claire. 100. 100 seconds. John. Oh, 75. 75. Oh, 80. 80. 80. 150. 100. <laughs> so Keith, the old hand, gives Jerry the slowest time, a man of little faith. 
Thrash it, Jerry. Go for it, Jerry. <laughs> go for it. Go on, pump yourself up, son. Go on. There's women watching. Go on. <laughs> a warm-up lap, it was time to get the clock going. Here he, here he comes, here he comes. Right, ready? Here he went. As soon as he goes under here, yeah? Hey! Right, we're up. After several agonising weeks, it's the big day. And despite the setbacks, the squad have made it to Mallory Park Racetrack. Right, Find that gear. He drives it like a granny, he definitely does. Here he comes, let's see what the time, that time. One minute 16. One minute 16? One minute 16, that's fast. That's fast, still not fast enough. <laughs> We this have is discovered it, something. something. <laughs> mm. Jerry doesn't know we know. <laughs> but Jerry, we've got a cameraman over the far side, and he's telling us that Jerry's taking his shortcut, not doing a whole lap. Let's see if Jerry coughs to that, or whether he tries to keep it running. Yeah. So one minute sixteen, yeah, which there. is fast. The lap time is fifty-one point two, I believe. So, so do you think you can get to that? Twenty-seven seconds off. Right. Twenty-seven. Off, of, bad, the, off it, really? of the full lap time, yeah. Yeah. Um, will I get there? No, not today. Not with it blowing rain. No. Uh, also, not with a new engine. Also, but, perhaps because you didn't do a whole lap. Maybe. Ah. See, we've got another cameraman, yeah, right. there, Jill, <laughs> and he saw you take shortcut. Oh, the shortcut. You weren't supposed to... Ah! Ah! What we're going to do now, because Jerry was such a fraud earlier on when he was driving and he took the shortcut, we're going to let Keith have a go in the car. And if he comes up with a faster time, he's going to represent us in a race later on against two other cars. Like a rabbit down a hole, Keith hops back into the car that 30 years ago brought him his greatest triumph. <laughs> but it's been set up for Jerry, who's a lanky piece of work, and Keith is struggling to get comfortable. Still, 30 years of driving experience should give him some advantage. Keith's lap record is 51.2 seconds, but that was a long time ago. Is he still a contender, or has he lost the fire? Halfway round the track, and unsurprisingly, he's ahead of Jerry. Oh, oh dear. dear. Oh, dear. <laughs> go the man. One minute, one, minute, one second. second. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's fast. Fast. That is That's fast. fast. Keith was stacked faster than Jerry, and our money was on him for the race. You hero. <laughs> Excellent. He was thrilled to be back in the Widowmaker, but the car had been set up for Jerry, and Keith found driving it just too uncomfortable. That always moves it all, doesn't it? <laughs> I don't really want to drive it again, not because I don't want to drive the car, but my neck is too far forward, yeah, and the accelerator is coming on at the same time we're pushing a brake. So Keith, the bookie's favourite, was out. As a result, we decided to forgive Jerry for not coming clean about the shortcut. As apparently he'd had no option but to cut the course earlier as he was waved in by the marshals. So he was back behind the wheel of number 63 and it was time for the big race. It's Jerry Domino Thursden. If he goes, they all go. And they're off. Come on, Jerry! Come on! Come on! Come on! Come on. Jerry. And Jerry's into the first corner at 85 miles per hour. Go on, my son. He's going. He's going. He's second. Yeah. He's found the gears. He's yeah, found yeah, the gears. Yeah. Come on, 
Jerry's getting the hang of this and sees his chance to grab the lead. He's looking good into the chicane. It doesn't last though. On the next lap, the yellow McLaren retakes the lead. Jerry tries to fight back but can't regain the lead. But it's a respectable second place for the Lola, back on the track more than 30 years since her Grand Prix victory in 1969. <laughs> but today's real victory for the salvage squad isn't winning the race. After their tussle with the Lola's soggy engine, dodgy brakes and shattered parts, it's being here at all that's the real triumph. Turbocharging Thursday night, it's a brand new Quest Original at 9 in Cars That Rock with Brian Johnson. Up next though, Mike Burr and Mechanic Ed China are wheeler dealers.